So uh, Carol and Klaus showed you bits of, of this. Um, it's, I think, a very pretty image in different regards. So we, we know Geoscience Australia and Australia is very fortunate for having the sort of data coverage we have. Um, we've been in conversations with our colleagues from the US and Canada, different parts of the world. No other country in the world has the geophysical coverage you guys have at the tip of your fingers, and it's for free, all right? So there's a reason for that. It's um, Australia, roughly around 80% of it is under some sort of cover, right? So most of the rocks that had to be licked, kicked, and scratched have been done. So now there's all this, this, uh, these other areas that are under some sort of cover that need to be imaged in a way. And we've been doing it for a while, right? So back, um, back in the days, in the 60s, GA had an initiative and we had planes and we had engineers, so we flew a very tight magnetic line spacing that has been increasing through time, which most people use, probably don't even know the origins of it. And we have done the same with gravity and um, radiometrics, right? So what we're moving to is the next generation of geophysical data sets, and that's the AEM. Because although potential fields are a very good ma uh, mapping tool for delineating structures, the reality is you cannot derive depth from these images, right? So it's just a lateral, um, lateral perception of how things are varying, which is very useful. But we are now needing to, to, to make discoveries underneath the cover. So that's where we're calling this the next generation of geophysical data sets. Um, so this is the coverage we have so far. It's about 60% of the, of the continent. Um, the, the, um, Klaus and Carol already talked about the complexity of the 20 line spacing. Um, you can see we've flown the, the the, the um, surveys in different directions. For instance, if I can draw your attention there to the border between Queensland and Northern Territory, that addresses the need to try and as much as possible fly perpendicular to geology, right? So that's kind of, it's a beautiful image. It has meant, um, it, the, the logistics has been something unheard of. Um, the USGS came and had a chat with us. They sent some of their top geophysicists, and we shared the technology, some of, of our inversion codes, and we sh showed the know-how. So it's quite kind of humbling, but also something to be proud that a small group like us in GA, which maybe 10% of the resources people-wise can have pulled this off, and we're kind of sort of leading the way in that regards. And it's, um, I think it's a great legacy for, for all Australians, not only in the mineral exploration space, because as has been said before, we are using these data sets for energy, groundwater, agriculture, hazards, and that's kind of the, the whole idea, right? Um, something that is very interesting, this is this what I'm showing you is just, are just the surveys flown with um, public funds. So um, that's, there's like close to 900,000 line kilometers from these, these are, these are numbers from David Howard from the Jill survey of um, private owned companies that have flown after five years, they, they submitted to the survey and those are um, open source data sets that are there to be scrutinized, analyzed, inverted, and um, they provide a whole bunch of wealth of information that is out there. So just, just mentioning that. So a little bit of exploring through cover, and I've, we've already talked about um, the AM technique. There's um, some dispute about who can coin it and claim it, and it's 
somewhere there between the Russians and the Canadians, apparently. Um, so they were flying EM to try and, and, and unveil big conductive bodies in resistive environments, right? Um, AEM then came to Australia, and of course we have a super complex environment, and that is we have a conductive cover, right? So I, I just wish, hope to kind of take you through the journey of how this is um, evolved and, and, and how we have progressed from having the possibility of standing up there in one of the sand dunes and having no idea of what lies belief to then having a clear picture through an inversion product of you know, a layer that has been eroded and then um, filled and sort of with water or, or salt. And it gives us a, a very nice picture of where, for instance, to drill or take some geochemical samplings, where to go and source some water, things like that. It talks, tells a, a, a bit of a story about evolution of the continent too. Then, as I said, um, we are very lucky to have Neil and Seb, who have been in the journey through the inversion to then bringing their wealth of, of geology. So ideally, what we want is to convert volts. So we, ma we measure volts, it's electricity at the end of the day and magnetics, to some sort of knowledge, right? And that is um, what you will do in the, in the last um, session today. So we'll go from some numbers, crunch it through our machinery, and um, the guys will take you through the journey of, of actually extracting something hopefully useful. OK, so just very basically, so what are the principles of AEM, operational principles? We have a, a primary field that is transmitted in one of the coils. This will induce a secondary AM field in a conductor. Um, then the amplitude of the secondary field is dependent on the rock properties that are affected, um, the, that affect the electrical conductivity, as you can see there. So just a little bit of scale. This is always important to have things into perspective. We have a footprint of, of the aircraft which is, looks like a beam, a light beam, that can be up to several hundreds of meters at surface as, because it's the physics of a, a diffusive source. As we go deeper, it becomes more diffuse and it goes wider, right? So a lot of people in the past have tried to debunk AEM surveys saying, well, I have a drill hole and I've done downhole conductivity. Well, there's many more things to consider this than just downhole is the absolute truth. We're talking things about um, scales and, and, um, and other nature. So although you could argue AEM works in a similar way, the physics are similar to a metal detector, you would not go and commission an AEM survey to go and find grandma's ring that she lost at the, in the paddock one day because of the scale, right? It's just not that sort of technique. And that's very important when you're doing your planning, of course. So what, and manager expectations, what are we able to resolve, yeah? So that's that. Just a little animation of how AEM works. I've got a 17-year-old trying to help him with um, maths and physics, and I know uh, sometimes we, someone says something in one way, I don't get it, you, we change it. So this is an animation trying to also show the, the principles of how AEM works in a little bit of an animation way. We've got a transmitter loop. We have a time-varying current, which is called our waveform, usually. We put it through that transmitter loop, so that's uh, uh, an alternating current. Um, that in turn sets up a time-varying magnetic primary field. And that is recorded in the receiver coil. Yeah, the flux threads through that receiver. Um, that's the recording of the induced primary voltage in the receiver coil. 
So now we introduce a conductive Earth, which is what we're doing. We were kind of that first, those first animations were in isolation in the vacuum, but we are flying this over Earth. Um, and that is what in turn generates eddy currents. So that's why the, peculi the, the particularity of where we're flying will determine the kind of response we're getting. Yeah. This then will set, set up a secondary magnetic field. Um, and that's what, we're, what is recorded in the, in the receiver coil. So we have a primary cent, a secondary voltage. And that's what's logged into our computer or in our DAC, our uh, digital acquisition system. So what I've just explained there, I'm going to have to crack you through the mathematical expression of that. And that's where it'll get a little bit hard. But don't, don't get overwhelmed. Um, um, Anand will probably spend a little bit more time there. But we have to introduce the forward response, which is the, the maths and the physics of how we're explaining this phenomena to actually crunch it through an algorithm that then produces a pretty picture. So it is not a simple task, but it is um, something not to get overwhelmed. And even if we have a slight understanding, I think it's better than having none. So what are the factors that, um, that control an AM response? There are several. One is the conductivity, so the, of the material. But there's also the medium that we're flying over has certain porosity, has saturation, um, and the, the composition of, of, of the pores, the arrangement within the structure. And that, in turn, will, will determine the different lithologies, st structures, and alterations, or if there's groundwater or not. That, those are all factors that, that contribute to the response we are measuring on the AM signal. So those are factors that will come to play uh, again when, when you guys are looking at your interpretation, knowing the context and, and a little bit of the geological knowledge of where you are. So this is a controversial slide. Um, my colleague Neil doesn't like it, but I do. I think it's, uh, and it's controversial because you cannot derive a conductivity. Remember, we're going from volts to conductivity to geology. So it's a proxy all the way, right? So you cannot derive a value of conductivity and say, I've got a conductivity of um, 3 millisiemens per meter at 10, at 10, depths, uh, at 10 meter depths, and then say, I've got a massive sulfide there. That is not possible. And the reason is, you can see the broad range of, um, of conductive values, plus all the factors like porosity and water that we've talked about, that will um, determine what sort of material you have. But this is like a little dictionary. Look at it as a dictionary that can help you or assist you in, 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 the, um, in the interpretation. So throughout these presentations, and because we're in the southern hemisphere and things are right here, um, conductors will always be red. And we'll talk about conductivity. And, and resistors are blue. So that's just so we get familiar with that through, um, through, through the day. With the inductive method of AM, what we're looking is for conductors. That's our objective. So also an important thing to have when you're planning. So if you're looking for voids or things, maybe you be, should be looking at resistivity. What you're looking is for clays, for massive sulfides, for salt water intrusions. That's what we're targeting because of the nature and the physics that underpins this method, right? So enough said, but if there's no contrast, you won't see anything. That's, that's kind of a given, right? OK, just a little bit of history. And that's we're getting into the pretty pictures. Um, uh, a little bit of history about AEM through GA's history. So we had some initial trials in the early 90s more around salinity mapping. And that happened 
mostly around the border between New South Wales and Victoria. Yeah? And that was quite successful. That's kind of where some of our learnings about how to model AEM came about. Um, then there has been several other things like the Patterson, the Pine Creek, and those were at different scales. We had sur surveys that were for flown at 500 meter separation between the lines, two kilometers, five, etc. Till more recently, we have settled on the 20 kilometer line spacing, but we have some projects that are targeted for, for instance, groundwater exploration. Um, one is the Upper Darling Flood plane that has just concluded. That's a 30,000 line kilometer survey. Anand will show you a little bit more about that. And that has also variable spacing, much, much finer resolution. And, and the information you can get out of it is just um, astounding, I think. So. so a little bit of to continue in the history, we have moved from what is a data transform. So you would have heard of conductivity depth images or conductivity depth transforms, which are not really inversions. They're just like a, a quick transformation. Think about apparent resistivity, if you guys might be f familiar with it. And there's a couple of knobs and, and things you can, and levers to pull and push that can produce an image. So that's a reasonable um, image we could argue, but we have definitely moved from bump finding to more quantitative analysis. We want to actually know and tell the driller what depth do I expect to find that contact. And that, from our perspective, can only be done realistically with inversion. Um, so through history, GA has developed the tools to be able to do that and um, I will be talking about the QA and QC side of things, but one of the tools we use to do our curation and our quality assurance and control is the inversion. That is our main instrument to query the data through modeling it, right? So um, maybe Anand will go a little bit more about that, but I'll just tell you briefly. We have different generations of codes. Most of you probably have or probably haven't heard of the GA-LEI, which is the layered earth inversion, was developed by Ross Brody. And then we have a new generation, which um, is what, what we'll present and show you guys today. They're all open source. So a little bit about the survey design. Someone there said that they did a, a survey design, as I mentioned, we have these beautiful images um, of the whole continent. This is the gravity image that was put together by Richard Lane before he actually unfortunately left us. It's an image that is composed by ground stations, airborne stations, and satellite imagery. Yeah. So that's, the, that's why you guys or everyone in Australia or the world has a gravity map, a seamless gravity map of Australia. Um, because of work like that. And why I mention it is because I've just displayed the AEM lines and why we have planned them like that is to try and uh, intersect the geology in the right locations, right? So the Albany Fraser is there. We're trying to intersect it in that direction, etc. right? Okay. Yes? What is the reason for the gaps in the East Coast? Um, we, we haven't got, got to it yet, but that the intention is, yeah, exactly. So what is in white is what we're currently flying as in today. We have a plane there and we're going up north. Um, these are gaps, but they're flying. We are talking to our colleagues in New South Wales. They are flying a little bit, Queensland. So this is in the, it's in the working, yeah. Mm -hmm. Name two words. <laughs> that's, that's one part of it, yes. And then the magnetics. I mean, these are beautiful data sets. Again, that's a gray image. Look at the detail we get from the mag that a lot of the geological mapping in Australia doesn't get acknowledged, has been done thanks to the geophysicists because there's nothing to map at surface. 
So most of our geological mapping is done through the geophysics. Um, so now we're trying to add that second dimension of trying to give you the depth with the AM, right? Um, so that's again on the planning, you know, you grab your, your mag, your, your, um, your gravity, and of course, now what about the agriculture sector? What about um, the, soil, the soil, the geomorphologist, the soil, the soil map um, people? Yes, well, they've got the radiometrics, something to consider also. There's extremely interesting bits. So if you're thinking at stuff at the near surface like there, this is where we are. Um, I'll just run you really quickly through a few um, frequency domain surveys, systems, just for fun, and time domain. Um, I want to say before we continue, any trade product or firm that we mentioned here, we heard Tempest, Skytem, Excite, VTEM, is just exclusively for descriptive purposes. We don't, as the government agency, endorse one company over another, right? We can model and we know the physics of them. You can discuss the resolution till the cows come home, but we don't endorse it. We don't endorse one over the other. I'll tell you a little bit about our technical deeds, which we have established with them, but that's a different story. So I'm just going to show you a few. This is a geotem system. That is a hoistem that was developed in Australia because it looks like a hill hoist, as you can see there. Um, that's the, a skytem developed by the Danish team. Uh, that's the Tempest, which was actually a CRC product originally, then it went and was purchased by Fugro, CGG, uh, and now Excalibur. But that's, you, we could claim that as an Australian product, we should. Um, and just a little bit now, we're getting on how the data is acquired. So just think about, you're sounding the ground, yeah, you're pulsing it, and then there's an off time. In the off time is where you're just listening or recording the response from the ground. On the on time, we're actually pumping the primary field, right? So you could say in the contrast is so high that it would, let's say, pollute the, um, the signal because it's induced man-made um, signal. So what we're listening to in the off time is actually the signal from the ground. That's, um, that's what I'm showing here on the left. Then on the right, we have a two-layer model. Um, if we were talking about one of the fixed wing components, you are measuring with a dipole the X and the Z component and the Y. We usually don't get delivered the Y. And that's what it looks like. It's how current is decaying through time. Right. So I was just talking about we have a deed of understanding um, with G in GA. Um, what this means is we have spent a lot of time looking at the technical aspects of each system with the system contractors. So we have an agreement of what the minimum noise level is, for instance, what the space between the receiver and the transmitter is the, the, the moment. There's a whole bunch of technical specifications that are absolutely essential. So when any company comes and flies in Australia for the government, we have a deed of understanding that says these are the technical specs that you have to adhere to. And that kind of guarantees that the Australian taxpayer is uh, you know, not spending their money on something that we can't model, at least. I'm not going to promise anything else. Uh, but if they are on our deed, um, we, can, we can model it. These are the four c companies that currently are on our deed. So a little bit about the workflow. Uh, and I won't dwell too much on this, but just because this is what's going to happen. So at the first stage, it's the acquisition, the planning, then 
Um, we do a little bit of the curation through an inversion, and that's where Anand will, will, will spend some time going from volts to, to a conductivity section or, or plan if you were flying at a tighter line spacing. Um, of course, we are acquiring um, data roughly at about every 8 to 15 meters separation, right? So if you think of that, that's a huge amount of data. And each point can be t treated as an individual sounding. That's what that's trying to reflect, that little cross. Um, then Seb and Neil will, will do their magic and show us how you go from a conductivity section to a meaningful geological interpretation of what, what lays beneath. So I hope you're there with me, because these are the four hard slides I have. <laughs> OK, so and it's his fault, but it's OK. I, I like a challenge. So um, please be with me and, 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 and try whatever you can get from it. it it's, it's good. We just can <laughs> just acknowledge what I'll try to, to try and explain. It's how the Ford model, um, how many minutes is that? 12, Twelve that's fine. Um, so how we're going to go from the conceptual physics to, to actually doing it, in expressing it in a mathematical way. So the forward calculates a theoretical vector received given a conductive model that's described through Maxwell's equations. And these, in order to get a forward model, we need to solve partial differential equations. That seems complex. It's for different complexities for different people. But just be, where, be there with us, you know? We have different concepts about how we discretize the Earth, right? And in geophysics, we talk about the quasi-static approximation, which means depends it, physically what we're looking at. We're trying to solve problems at a scale that are much shorter than the greater wavelengths. So then a lot of terms are simplified. That's in a nutshell what, 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 what we're doing, OK? You will see and hear a lot about 1D versus 2D versus 2.5D. All the codes we develop in GA are 1D. What that means is that we assume things are changing with depth, but are horizontally homogeneous, right? And there's a reason for that. We found 85% of our soundings can be fit with 1D. And um, when you start bringing complexity into the model, of course, that incre increases the degree of ambiguity. So we want to stay away from that, all right? So I'll just run you uh, a little animation quick of how, um, and Anand will go into much detail, much more detail than that, but this, this little animation just shows in the red dot here, the red dots here, that's your observed data, and then through the iteration process, which is an inversion, you try to fit the model. Then you can get a conductivity that is varying with depth. That's in a nutshell what I'm going to show you in hardcore maths. <laughs> so the first concept, and that's not too hard. It's the reflection of a plane wave. So here, the expression up there is a dipole, which is your plane. It's interacting with the Earth. And that area there, that region, is called the Air-Earth um, air interface. It's a very important concept, because according to that, your mathematical, um, the, the, the mathematical assumptions are one or other at the boundary conditions, right? One wave is traveling downwards and it's being reflected, right? That's, this is what this equation is, is showing and it's composed of two bits. Let's say this arrow is this bit, this arrow is that bit and that reflects that arrow coming in and coming out. That's a reflection. That's the, that's the um, plane wave interface. There's another component. Uh, sorry. 
So we can see there's a difference there. This reflection coefficient, otherwise these two are the same, and the, the change of sign, which means this wave is traveling that way and that one is traveling that way. So that's the change of sign, the different direction, and this coefficient happens at that interface. Then there's another component that keeps going downwards, which, which reflects this other vector. And that's what's transmitted into the media. Sorry. <laughs> I won't get more into that, but this, um, the two components of permittivity, conductivity, permeability, are physical properties that tell us how easy or hard it is for electrical charges to flow through the medium, right? So just, just take that in mind, because these are this is what this is kind of all the machinery that we, we put together behind so then an inversion can run. Okay? We're getting there. I mean, it's not too bad. We're going then, there's these things called the Fresnel equations that talk about tangential uh, fields. We derive the reflection coefficient, which is what we talked about, that coefficient that is characteristic to that interface where, where the air and the earth meet, let's say. And then the transmission coefficient, which accounts for the height of the dipole source. So if you, what, in, in plain words, if I can, that accounts to how far or close we are, in this sense, the plane, um, from, from our source. Okay, I won't go more into that. <laughs> and then this is interesting because you will use it. This is part of the code that Anand is gonna make you run. And don't get too scared, it's pretty, pretty good, but I, we have to introduce you to it. It's just how these fields relate on a layer by layer because this is what we call a 1D Earth, right? It's like a stack. Uh, um, a cake stacked one upon each other, and those coefficients of reflectivity, transmissivity, etc., have a relation. Don't worry about that. Don't, you don't have to understand any more. If I've taken you there, more than happy. My last um, slide, just to to make it the, the dullest one, sorry, is the Hankel transform because the Hankel transform is the way we solve these complex mathematical equations and we bring the characteristics of the system. That is, um, the dipole moment, the characteristics if you're flying a skyton versus a tempest or whatever, those are, are, are all kind of put together in the pot and through solving these Hankel transforms, which are Summerfield type integrals, that's how we compute what we're really after. Sorry, Carol, I, I know I'm probably gonna go a little bit over time, sorry, Neil, but it was just, that was hard. <laughs> okay, um, so what we're solving is in a nutshell, as we said, imagine this, now we're getting back into the picture so people breathe. Um, we're, we're getting all these parameters that are measured that we have to account, you know, you, some we measure, some we derive, and with that, we, we produce the pretty picture of conductivity. Phew, I got past that one. Right, so just very quickly, now we're going into ca um, calibration and, quant and quality control. I just want you to take home, no system is the same as another. So there's no bespoke, um, every system is quite bespoke, there's no rather um, off-the-shelf so solution. So we must understand the peculiarities, the idiosyncrasies of each system. And the problem with this, or the good thing, is the systems are constantly evolving. The electronics are evolving. The materials are getting lighter, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're trying to sample at lower frequencies. They're um, pumping more current through the dipoles. That's important. Remember, AM operates under very different circumstances. When you t send a crew to do your EM acquisition, lay a loop, you can stack for ages. What that means is you do a recording, you do another one, you do another one, and you reduce the noise. When you have a moving platform that is sampling at the speed of light, that increases the complexity. So there's a lot 
behind this. The systems cannot be calibrated in, 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 the, in the lab. That's another fact, right? Some aspects can, but essentially they can't. Um, time quality control is time consuming. So yes, treasure that. One thing is to value your data acquisition. And yes, of course, a lot of the contractors do a very good job on that. But I think when you commission a survey of this nature, you, have, you better be sure that you or someone in your company is kind of doing the same. Just briefly, I talked already about the, the established deeds. These are these kind of charts that we have signed with them, so they're legally binding. And they, they, they talk about you know, the nominal heights, the ground speeds they should be used, number of moments, every kind of peculiarities that describe the instrument. And why is this important? This is a pretty picture, you must say. It's a bit crowded, but, <laughs> but um, these are just representations of uh, one model, which is this model, of a three-layered model, and how different every instrument responds to that same ground. So you need to understand your instrument. That's, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say, right? Um, I saw Antonio there at the back talking about geometry and moving his hand, which is exactly what I'm going to talk about now. So when, with the fixed wing systems, um, those three components, you're measuring the vector in three, in three dimensions. Because although we're doing 1D um, inversion physics, the, the acquisition is 3D. There's no, there's no getting around that. So that's why the complexity is there too, right? So understanding those rotations and how those things are moving and twisting are quite important. So don't trust me because what I'm trying to show here is the response, different responses by changing the range. So see what's called there dx and dz, and you will use this in the practicals. So what I've done here, what we've done here is we showed you the effect of varying that distance, either vertically or horizontally. You can see the different responses. So if you don't account for that really well, you're going to get a very different response. Right? You can get variations in thickness or on conductivity of your model. So that's kind of just the effects of the system geometry, what we call. Because I'm talking about QA, QC, quality control, one of the things we monitor is here on your x-axis, that's a distance of around the line, so that's 20 kilometers. And you can see the variations, um, the vertical separation. So that means how the transmitter is moving with regards to, to, to the receiver. And in this particular exercise, we worked with a company to try to derive. They didn't have any inclinometers or any way to measure what the bird was doing. So we did a whole bunch of different exercises like filming, etc. And you can see the variability, you know. So that's, that's quite important. Those are things that we put in our QAQC. And then Seb will talk to this, I hope, a little bit more. These are things we produce that are called multi-plots. And of course, it's, um, lots of people just oversee them because I ju I'm just interested in this. And why wouldn't you look how beautiful, you know? Um, the reality is all of this is really helpful. These multi-plots are like um, the pilot looking at at, uh, 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 at the dashboard, saying, OK, wh what's going on? I can try and understand. So in this panel, we have the data. Then the level of fit. As I said, that's the agreement, to some extent, between the model and the, um, and the measured data. As, as I showed previously, the variation um, of, of the receiver, the transmitter, then we have here, so that's the transmitter height. Then we are monitoring the spherics. And you see this little peak here? That's a power line, right? So how many times hasn't someone said, oh, yes, drill there? No, there was a power line or a pipe or something. So 
Um, and I think um, uh, probably Seb will, will talk a little bit more about that. But it's just important to understand all these things. They're recorded. They're there on your data sets. So display them. When you're looking at an interpretation, Seb will do that. They, he will look at these things and say, am I fitting the data first? Yes, no. Um, am I over a pipe? Am I over close to a power line? Those are things that are important, right? So this is, um, this is why we generate these multi-plots. Yes? That one where you've got the power line, what does that actually plot of what's on the vertical axis? Um, I think that's, uh, well, I think it's some degree of voltage. I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's, it's a distinct feature right there. Um, what, is, what is interesting, though, is despite this being there, the inversion through the, the, our noise model has handled it quite well, and there's no artifact on the inversion. Um, there's other things that the companies do. For instance, the spherics, so lightning that is happening that can contaminate the signal. And the, as part of their processing, um, they do uh, a spike reduction, lightning reduction filtering. So, so it's, it's probably, uh, in Australia, what is it, 40 hertz, right? You know, 50. 50, 50. 50 mm -hmm. hertz. So 50 hertz, it's a harmonic, so it's the, it's the power spectrum. So it's probably harmonics at 50 hertz. And you're just seeing at every location the value of you know, the spectrum at that harmonic. And so if it spikes up, well, then you've got. Uh -huh. okay. Also, when, when you're flying up north, you have sometimes interference of very low, low frequency, right? Because the transmitting to the submarines, we have a, a, a VLF a trans, transmission line up, up in the Cape. So that's something we monitor also. OK? Just putting it out there. Now, um, what, this is kind of the same thing. But why I'm showing this one, because I think it's pretty cool what you can see is the contrast, right? And you can see the contrast in the inversion. But if you were only looking at the pretty pictures, you could probably be very skeptical. It's like, is this real? I would. But having the multi-plots, first, I can see I'm fitting the data all the way. The other thing is the character of the data itself. You can see this is one block of data. It then gets quite flat. Then we're moving into different aspects. There's some interesting anomalous bodies. So what I'm trying just to, to, to bring you is to the idea, let's try and look at inversion products and AM conductivity sections, not just like a pretty picture of conductivity and depth. There's much more to it. And there's a lot of work that's gone into it. So, so yes, use it, I think. Um, a little bit more of the model assessment, and I won't go into that too much because that's Anand's job. But this is one sounding. So when we are assessing, and, and why I touch on it is because this is, as I said, our, our quality control, quality assurance tool. When we get data, we get data delivered in three different stages. When they're in the field doing the acquisition, and then at a process where they've kind of bundled it up and give it to us in the final product. So whilst the data is coming in, we're doing our checks. So as, as, uh, as I said, sort of part of our assessment is we're checking how well or not we're fitting the data. And the fit means the match within the noise envelope, right? So. Why that's important? Because I'm going to take you to a practical that just shows the noise envelope. This is a similar derivation of, um, of a multi-plot. The colors up there show where there's more or less agreement between the reds and the blues. So you want it to be as white as you can. And um, where it's not, it's kind of indicating where the data is fitting better or worse. Um, I won't spend much more time on this because we need to move on. Um, setting standards, we also, one of the things we do as quality control is we get people, we've got all the companies to fly a coincident line. We have two calibration ranges. One is in the Manindi Lakes where we have previous conductivity logs down. 
And the other one is um, very close to Perth, called the Jinjin Calibration Range, which is here close to Julamar. What have we managed to, do, to derive from this? You can see um, four different sections, you know, that have been flown with the AEM. And, well, we can argue if there would, one is better or worse, but we have the downhole conductivity that there has been coded the same as, as the sections. And you can see we have quite a lot of confidence that we are modeling what is resolvable with the, with, um, with the four different systems. Interesting, in, in this part of the world, between, in South Australia, between WA and the Northern Territory, that's called the Eastern Musgraves, there's some historical surveys. No, you can't always have access to the calibration range, but the amount of data that is flown in Australia, there's a good chance you can get your contract to fly over an existing line, right? And that is very helpful because you can do direct comparisons and see what you're going to derive. Um, one target, what, what, what is a feeble target for some, what is feeble for some is a target for others. So different systems in this case have been looking on the left there for the, that's a discrete conductor at depth. And on the right, we're looking for a paleo channel. I'll show you that same line for the paleo channel. So yes, the derivation and then the analysis of an individual sounding. Then through, through um, conductivity and, and, and interpretation, you derive a, a, a map of cover thickness, which, uh, the, which is in the realm of, of the latest section. And just this is another example that is probably just in, interesting in the sense that we have two systems that have been flown opposite directions. They're, very, they're different systems. And just having a little bit of ancillary data, like lithology in this case, can assist in the interpretation, but also assessing the model as part of your QAQC. So you have drill holes, get them to fly over them. Um, the quality assurance and the quality control, there's two very different aspects. And probably sometimes we don't appreciate that. What's the difference between quality assurance and quality control? Assurance happens during acquisition. Right? You can get them to refly a line, you can check the noise levels, etc. Um, control is after. It's all good. it's done. You can say you can go and put get a tick with your manager and say, ah, they did it wrong. <laughs> but you, there's a hard chance you're gonna get them to refly when the crew has demobilized. Um, so one is proactive, the other one is reactive. Why I'm saying this is if you guys are going to really get involved, and that's what we hope, um, be involved while they're doing acquisition. Get them to send your repeat line you know, at the end of the week now and then say, look, I want to check. Before the survey happens, have your, your software ready so you know you can invert and model the data. Yeah. Um, this is a, an example that Anand is very proud of because it's Neil. It's um, it's a huge Titanic job. It's it's beautiful. It's close to thirty thousand Ks. It's in the Upper Darling, and this image was produced Neil um, close to real time. So they're flying. They're sending us things every day, every second day, and we're inverting as we go. So instead of what was the question? Yeah, like one of your questions you said, shall I wait for three days? If we are doing this as we're progressing by the end of the survey, and I could show that to our directors and our branch heads, and everyone was like, wow, they haven't even finished flying. Yes, well, we're coming as they're going. Right? So that's, that's, that's where we're moving. Now, um, the noise. The noise in geophysics is super interesting, and that's what the practical is. I'm going to show you how to derive noise. And why is it important? Because if you don't have the measure of noise right, you can fit anything, right? It is a little bit like biodiversity. People always talk about the importance of biodiversity, but how many people do you know that really measure biodiversity in a systematical way? Same in geophysics. 
So in GA, we use a paper that I think was, did you manage? No. OK, I've got, I've got a paper that if you, anyone wants it, it was published in 2003 by Richard Lane and Andy Green about the derivation of noise. So what we do is we get them to fly at high altitude at the beginning uh, and at the end of each day on the fixed wings and once a, a day with, a, with the helicopters. So we can measure the instrument noise in the absence of a ground response at, at a K, a kilometer up. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through that stage of how you derive noise that you will then plug into your inversion. Then you will get a nice conductivity model. And then you will get a beautiful geological interp out of. So that's where we're going. So to wrap it up, I am confident and the more we look at stuff, these regional surveys open search space where the outcrop stops, right? There is no question about that. We've seen it time and time again. AM models join the dots between spare drill holes. There's, that's, that's quite evident, I hope. Um, it's a very good method for deriving depth, as we said. So it can model the basement cover interface, right? Which is very important for different purposes, but I'm not going to tell you about things you already know. Um, AM surveys are ideally suited for exploration in the top 300 meters, right? Um, particularly in the Australian condition, sometimes even shallower, of course. There's no question they reduce exploration risk. And now we're going to move into the practical. So what you're going to aim to do is derive these values of noise. So you, you, I'll run you through a little exercise. Um, we're going to derive noise for two systems, a Skytem and a Tempest, which are um, I'm, I've provided you the data from the high altitude. We call them zero levels. And hopefully, we'll go through it, and some questions will come. And that data, we might use it. Well, you use it implicitly in the inversion that, that will be the second half of um, Anand's talk. This is, the, this is the paper I was telling you about, estimating noise levels with AEM data. So if anyone wants a copy, or you can download it. It was published in 2003. Okay.